Hi. Last month I read the first three blog pieces in my series on discomfort. And tonight I'm going to read the most recent two. So there's five total right now. And these will be pieces four and five. Um, piece four is titled Discovering the Territory of Neutrality. Um, that's the title on my blog site. Um, and I'm going to just read it straight off the blog. This is the fourth piece in my blog series on discomfort. You can find the first one linked on my blog, as well as a YouTube of all of them being read on my YouTube channel. In this post, I'll be writing about the topic of neutrality, something I wrote a bit about last year. Sometimes we humans get lost in two speeds, immersed completely in something or avoidance of something. Sometimes these two are related. We get lost in a feeling, it overwhelms us, and then to cope with that, we turn off. Feeling pleasure or pain involves a lot of body engagement, and let's be honest, we're not a culture that has a healthy relationship with body engagement. Even while we may say we want to feel pleasure, or we would rather feel pleasure over pain, we may not know how to be comfortable with the body engagement that comes with pleasure. And as much as we may not like pain, we may be more familiar with managing pain than opening up to pleasure. There's a lot of possible territory to explore with all that, and I'm not going to go deeper into those specific areas. Instead, I'm going to write about how we might learn to navigate difficult territories, pleasure, pain, or other expressions, by also noticing and including resonance, res resonances we've not yet become familiar with. Moving beyond binary traps. How often have you spent time contemplating your neutral experiences? The experiences that exist outside of the bounds of enjoyable or uncomfortable, for example. For some of us, we can't help it. The, mo the moment we feel discomfort, it feels like all of us is uncomfortable. For some of us, we can't help it. We're driven to pay attention only to that which feels good. Our attention and the way we think can be exclusionary, exclusionary like that. This makes life really narrow and limited, however, because, because it is very unlikely that all of us feels good or that all of us feels uncomfortable. It's impossible for all of our sense receptors to be feeling the same thing, and it's impossible that X, insert that which is being focused upon, is the only experience that's happening. This binary kind of thinking, this or that, is very dominant in our culture and it, cont it contributes to how we oppress ourselves as well as others. Let's explore this using temperature. If you scan your body head to toes, I wonder how many variations of temperature there are. For me, I feel very warm in some places while other areas are quite cool, while other areas are a range of in-between. From this we can learn that, that in lived experience we are and creatures. We experience warmth and coolness simultaneously. Our binary trained minds often go against our experiences, however, focusing on just one aspect of our experience, as if that's all there is. When it comes to discomfort or pleasure, our minds are even more trained to focus on just one or the other. When we focus in such a binary way, we have to exclude everything else. An effect of that is that our world gets smaller as we become reduced to just that which is being focused upon. Have you ever felt afraid and in that state felt very small? This presents a similar dynamic. Parts of our brain are being utilized and parts of our brain are being excluded. Parts of our experience are being included and parts of our experience are being excluded. We often feel small because we're experiencing life as our child self did, our child self who indeed was small, and who is often unresourced, overwhelmed, and without agency. It can be very disempowering to be a child because of the lack of control we had. When we become, when we become afraid as adults, even though we have more resourcing and agency than we did when we were kids, we can easily forget that we are safe and resourced when that fear states come over us. We can easily feel disempowered. Now, let's imagine being afraid, and as we're aware of the discomfort of the fear, we're also aware of other things. Imagine being able to acknowledge the discomfort and or fear and also being able to notice that we are, there are sensations in the body that are actually quite fine. Imagine being able to name that we may feel safe 
but that we can look around the room and notice that we are physically safe. And in that moment, we may escape the binary world of either or and, and instead enter the world of both and. We both feel unsafe and are safe. This very quickly changes the dynamic and we can go from feeling lost in a sensation state to being in relationship with all that we're experiencing, the good, bad, and the ugly, or as I like to say, with what I don't like and what is also okay and fine. It can feel counterintuitive to take the time to include the and in our experience. And at first, it may not seem like it's changing anything in our experience. It takes time for the AND neural pathway to form, but once they do, the practice of inclusion becomes easier and, our sh and shifts our reality. Just like any practice, it is a process and it requires time and engagement. Learning to expand our attention. Because we're trained to think from a binary lens, it takes effort to include the full range of our experience rather than just focusing on one aspect. Because we're trained to think in terms of good and bad, good or bad, it takes effort to include aspects of our experience that are neither good nor bad and instead are neutral or okay or fine. A profound part of my journey has been learning how to make friends with the territory of neutrality. As I wrote in a past blog post, because I've been drawn to highs and lows and because I've had so many false ideas about waking up and healing, it took time for me to even be interested in what I'll call neutrality, the space in between good and bad. When we're used to the intensities of good and bad, neutrality may feel strange at first. For some, it may feel boring or empty. It may be uncomfortable or unsettling. We may feel twitchy or like we're doing something wrong. We may feel like there's nothing here. It can take time to know that just because something is different, doesn't mean it's wrong or bad or that we're in danger. And our entire sense of identity can be threatened when we start to engage the territory of neutral. As another client said, who even am I if I'm not feeling my usual X intense feeling? For them, it seemed that meaning and even vitality was gone when connecting to neutrality. It can take time for the nervous system to reorient toward health when, we're grown used, when we've grown used to the rush of pain or pleasure chemicals. It can be unnerving to not be caught in the binary, and it can be strange to be connecting with our bodies in direct experience. We are laden with ideas of what we think we should be experiencing, and when we, even for a moment, give them up and consider what, what we've not yet been including, we can become very insecure. This is a normal part of change, evolution, and growth. And yes, it can be uncomfortable. Said another way, including neutrality can bring about discomfort. Experi Here's an uh, experiential opportunity. Notice when you feel discomfort, you will likely also be experiencing not discomfort. It may not be comfort that you're experiencing, but you will likely be experiencing something other than discomfort. For example, I may feel a tightening in my solar plexus, which may feel uncomfortable for me. Nearby, somewhere nearby, I may feel neutrality, maybe in my pelvic floor, or ease in my chest, and even some comfort with the support that is behind my back. When we pause and explore, we may discover there is comfort, neutrality, and discomfort there is comfort, neutrality, and discomfort happening simultaneously. It is important for our well-being that we learn how to include more of our experience. Not everyone is challenged by neutrality. Neutrality might feel like a welcome relief after spending much of their life on, a roller coaster, on the roller coaster of life. The erratic ups and downs can be exhausting. For many, including neutrality can be a combination of sorts, challenging and relieving. One client shared, first I thought neutrality was nothing, and the place where I felt the trigger in my body was everything, and now I see the neutrality as something full and strong. As we continue to practice including the full range of our experiences in the simplest ways that we can, we will slowly learn that there is great vitality in all moments. In each inhalation, there is aliveness. In each heartbeat, vivacity. In each movement of our body, liveliness. 
in engaging any of our sense receptors, engagement with life. It takes time to move from living in our imaginations to living in direct experience. Please be gentle with yourself and make sure you have loving, compassionate, consensual support. I have, I have recorded many rest meditations that focus on inclusion, and then I link them in the blog post. As always, please let me know what questions or observations you have. If you're interested in these topics, you may be interested in my 10-month exploration coming up. Feel free to email me for more information. And then I also link an interview that I did with somebody talking about this topic. So I'm going to move on to the last, the last blog post in this series. And that is titled, on my blog site, it's titled, What Happens When We Explore the Territory of Safety and Discomfort? Here is my fifth piece in my blog series on discomfort. Okay. In my upcoming 2021 exploration, we will learn how life-altering it is to know safety within our being so that we do not have to try to control that which is outside ourselves in order to have safety. And we will learn how to support others in, the, in these discoveries as well. I had a fun conversation talking with Anna Maria, talking about some of these very topics. Click here to watch, and that link is on the blog page. In the last two blog posts, I wrote about the possibility of discovering a sense of well-being, even when there is discomfort. In this not next blog post, I will take that a step forward into the territory of safety, a topic that is very related to discomfort. Safety is another huge topic and a complicated one with lots of nuances. As such, this will be just a, a toe dip of sorts. If you haven't already read my previous posts in the series on discomfort or seen the YouTube video, please do as it leads into this post. Safety and Discomfort Safety and discomfort are very entwined, especially for survivors, but also for anyone who didn't grow up with people helping them to stay in their bodies when they experienced challenge. The topic of safety is so important for so many good reasons, but it is often misunderstood. I have discovered over time that unless our journey of well-being includes embodiment and our being, the science of the vagus nerve and brain health, practices of discernment, as well as knowing true sources of safety, we will actually wind up as more fragile humans. As I name that, I see scenarios flash be before my eyes. One I hear about often is the meditator who feels that all is well until they get off their meditation pillow. While there may be much utility to meditation, if it is not paired with consciously including and exploring, and exploring into our human experience, we will be limited by the false and unconscious belief systems that are habitual for us and remain disembodied. I have been that person. While meditation alone did provide clarity in some ways, it enabled a sense of fragility in other ways. I did not learn how to participate as a human and instead lived in a glass house. This unknowingly, of course, limited me to being a person who needed to control her life for fear of that glass breaking. This is a hard way to live. In another scenario, I'm thinking of someone I know who surrounds himself with only people who agree with them. Their past trauma has left their nervous system quite disorganized, and rather than focusing on consciously repairing that, they find people who will make them feel safe through validation and agreement. While there is nothing wrong with wanting validation, when our safety is dependent upon agreement from others, we will remain small and disempowered. This is the person who often does great in the world, but due to their inability to discern, their efforts are always limited due to believing that their safety hinges upon factors outside them, of them. The more they try to manufacture safety, i.e. control, the more insular they become and the more fragile they become. The more fragile they become, the more unsafe they feel, and the more unsafe they feel, the more dysfunctional their behavior becomes, and the cycle continues. I have been this person too. I have surrounded myself with people who see the world in similar ways as I do. Again, while there's nothing necessarily wrong with this, for me it reinforced a belief that I am not safe with people who see the world differently, which reinforced the premise that I am not safe as I am. It also stripped away opportunities to sit with experiences of awkwardness, conflict, and discomfort so that my system could discover that I am safe as I am, 
regardless of if people see the world as I do or not, and regardless of whether I'm uncomfortable or not. Maybe you've been nodding your head reading these scenarios. These are not unusual stories, although they may look different for each of us. Regardless of our circumstances, most of us learn what I call false conflation. We believe that if X, then Y, or if Y, then X. If we're uncomfortable, then we're unsafe, or we're unsafe because we're uncomfortable. Either way, there is a conflation of safety and comfort. Learning about ourselves, learning to name. When we think about the topic of safety, we often think about what will help us to feel safe, and we build those ideas of safety upon external factors. When X person does Z, I feel safe. When I'm in X location, I feel safe. When X is happening, I feel safe. When I'm in X circumstance, I feel safe. When I feel X, I feel safe. In my journey, asking curious questions of myself so that I can identify the factors I respond well to has been absolutely crucial and even profound. Getting clear enough to name things for what they are for us can be very empowering. It's important that we know ourselves well enough to determine how we feel in relationship to people, places, and things, and our own experiential happenings. And it is important that we know what comforts our system, our nervous system. Particular, particularly if we are rebuilding or discovering a healthy nervous system. Having said that, sometimes developing the self-knowledge to identify these things can be seen as the ending spot or goal, so to speak. In my experience, this self-knowledge is actually the beginning. There is much more empowerment and possibility available. When science meets the practicality of well-being, the naming process is an important aspect of our personal and collective evolution because developing the ability to observe a predicament enough to name involves neural pathways that connect to the prefrontal cortex. When this part of our brain is engaged, a few things happen. Our vagus nerve is connected to well-being. We're able to have some distance from the reptilian brain, which functions on survival responses as opposed to what is really going on in the moment. And we can have some ability to resource and self-regulate. This increased sense of resourcing and agency is empowering, as we're then connected to our sense of well-being. And yes, it does allow us to feel safe, which further relaxes our nervous system and allows us to experience a wider and deeper aspect of life with, with the source of life itself. All of this helps us being all of this helps helps us in being able to discern and inquire into our experience which allows us to see through and disrupt old belief systems and assumptions about our place in the world. As, if, as with everything, this is a process of discovery. Here's a personal story to illustrate. Last summer, I became part of a group of local activists who are protesting Nazis at our local market. The week before, some militia members showed up to support the Nazi farmers, carrying guns and knives, both legal as we have an open carry law. As you might imagine, I needed to prepare myself to enter into a situation knowing that there was the possibility of violence. Did I feel safe walking into that situation? Well, ultimately, yes. But was I safe because of the environment? No. Knowing the kind of violence these militia groups are capable of, for example, Charlottesville 2017, I knew I could be walking into a violent situation, i.e. not physically safe but I connected to something much wiser and larger, and that connection conveyed a sense of safety in my being. Was I comfortable? Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. Did I experience fear at times? Yes. <laughs> Through that experience, I learned that I could be in potentially violent circumstances with forces completely outside of my control, have some fear, feel some discomfort, and I could still be safe in my being. More importantly, I was also moving from love, which was, also, was a profound part of my experience and perhaps as its own blog post for another time. I'm often reluctant to share my experiences because you as the reader may not grasp how much effort and time it has taken for me to develop the resources and agency to be able to partake in these kinds of events, particularly from love. Furthermore, I'm not saying that everyone has to rush out there and protest Nazis at their local farmer's market. 
there is utility learning how to be present and engaged in the everyday experiences of our life. Unwinding the false conflations and misunderstandings about safety allows us to become active participants with life, which might allow us to have uncomfortable but important conversations with friends, children, families, neighbors, workmates, etc., even with ourselves. It might allow us to stay committed to things that are important to us, even when things get hot. It might allow us to get involved in creating change in our organizations and communities. It might allow us for uh, allow us to advocate for ourselves as well as others who are often not represented in our culture. And it might allow us to be in integrity with our actions and our emotions, and of course, so much more. Going deeper than safety. What? Deeper than safety? Well, if we keep getting real, eventually we will learn that absolute safety is an illusion. I cannot control what other people do or say. I cannot control factors outside of me. I can also not control all the thousands, millions of microcosms happening within my body. What I can do is connect with my sense of well-being and learn how to, be, how to develop a relationship with that so that I know it so deeply that nothing can strip it from me. I may have what I call momentary bouts of amnesia when it comes to this knowing, but they are short-lived because I now have the ability and the resources to connect with it. Developing this knowing is not necessarily easy. As I said earlier, it takes conscious effort and practice to develop the resources and agency because most of us have never been taught how to be in relationship with ourselves, so we lack the self-knowledge with regard to being present with our experiences. In fact, for most of us, the neural pathways that enable this do not even exist. We literally have to build these neural pathways through conscious practices, practices that include embodiment in our being, that include the science of vagal nervous system and brain health, that include practices of discernment, as well as the practices which develop a relationship of knowing true sources of safety. Gently exploring our experiences. The reality is that I can literally be safe, but be convinced that I'm not. And I can do all the right things and not have much well-being at all. What do I do with that? When we're triggered and enter into fear, our prefrontal cortex stops working efficiently. So the first thing we have to do is build enough self-awareness to know when our nervous system is activated and that we're triggered. This very important naming can dramatically influence the quality of our life because then we will have the ability to slow down and inquire into what's going on. What can help us realize we're triggered? When we're in a triggered state, we might have narratives that sound something like this. Wow, my thoughts are really spinning. I'm thinking, saying, writing the same thing over and over and over. My heart rate rate has increased. Ooh, I'm sweating. I'm feeling overwhelmed. My gut, throat, chest, fists are tight, clenching, and so on. I need to do something and I need to act now. These are many, there are many more possibilities, but these responses tell us that our nervous systems are triggered. If we do not slow down, it won't take long for us to experience increased fear. And from there, we will quickly start to make false assumptions about our safety. Our prefrontal cortexes won't be online, so we won't have the ability to think clearly. This is why slowing down is both hard yet crucial. Without the self-awareness to connect with our experiences, we will also steamroll ahead. Once we slow down, or if you're in a session with somebody, your therapist can help you with that, then curious questions can be asked. Curious questions come from the prefrontal cortex. We can ask ourselves about the underlying assumptions going on with regard to our experience. I might ask or say to myself, I know I feel overwhelmed triggered, unsafe, or in danger. But am I really in this moment? When we slow down to examine the actuality of our experience, we learn that we can have simultaneous experiences. In other words, I can feel unsafe in danger, but when I look around my room, I can see very clearly that I'm not unsafe or in danger. I can keep exploring. 
okay, I feel unsafe and I can see that I'm not. But wow, this sensation is really painful and I'm really uncomfortable and overwhelmed. Am I really safe? At that point, I would need to look around the room again. And then I can name to myself, if this feels true, okay, wow, I am feeling something really uncomfortable and painful. And I can see with my eyes that I am safe. I am not in danger. Let me connect to breath or feel my body in the chair for a few minutes. This is the process. This process is the way to start to unwind all the false conflations about fear, safety, discomfort, and well-being. I would strongly encourage you to find someone to help you with this process because in my experience, as someone who works with trauma every day, it is not easy for to hold this for oneself. In fact, all of your strategies will steer you away from this, maybe. Also, keep in mind that our culture thinks in binary relationships, so including the and is very important. This allows us to discover that we can feel unsafe and be safe at the very same time. Compassion for ourselves. I hope this blog post has been helpful. While learning about the territory of safety and discomfort is crucial, it is not easy. I invite us to be slow, gentle, and kind with ourselves while we learn and unlearn. One thing that helps me with this is to remember that life can be messy, and sometimes I have a hard time embracing the mess. <laughs> I remind myself that is okay, and I rest in the kind, compassionate, real words of Alexis Pauline Gums, who writes, The primary offering here is a space to be. Be here. Be all over the place. Be messy. Be wrong. Be bold in your helpfulness. Be confused in community. Be reaching past isolation. Be part of the problem. Be hungry for after. Be helpful in the midst. Be so early in the process. Be broken by belief. Be bolstered by brave comrades. Be unbelievably unready. This is by Alexis Pauline Gums uh, in the forward of the book Beyond Survival. In my upcoming 2021 uh, exploration, we will learn how to how we will learn how life altering it is to know safety within our being, so that we do not have to try to control that which is outside ourselves in order to have safety, and we will learn how to support others in discovering this as well. Please let me know if you have questions. And I also link uh, back to that interview that I gave recently. So if you have any uh, feedback, I'm always happy to hear that. Uh, and if you'd like to, me to write on another topic re relating to discomfort or comfort um, or safety, uh, anything in, the, in this uh, big field of territory, please do let me know. Thanks very much for listening.